can't understand the prayer, uh, Abba, Father, without going to the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus is heard, um, first one in Scripture, to utter that prayer to the Father. And he does it as he is um, facing his greatest moment of suffering and, and, and temptation, uh, facing the cross. And um, that cry to his Father um, strengthens his soul for... Um, to commit himself in obedience uh, to the Lord's call on his life um, in the face of his suffering. And so it's, it's, it's precious to think about that and the fact that it's by the Spirit of Christ. He, he's given us his Spirit so that we too can cry, pray that prayer, cry that cry as we face uh, the sufferings and the crosses that the Lord has given us to bear. And uh, so let's pray now um, as... God has graciously given us access to him. Um, we prayed um, uh, for the past couple of weeks for a, a man named Glenn Brad Bradford. Uh, Simon and Brianne had um, drawn our attention to his plight. He suffered a stroke, uh, fell into a coma, and has uh, since gone home to be with the Lord. So we, we pray for his wife and his, his children. And um, also uh, keep um, both Norm... Um, in prayer, Colleen's father and Dave's father, Art. Um, uh, Norm, was he able to get the, the shot this past week? And okay. So he received a shot for the pain in his back, and we'll pray that it's effective. Um, Dave's father, Art, um, is... Uh, they're still doing diagnostic work on him to, to see where the bleed, internal bleeding, is at. But um, he seems to be stable at the moment, so we give thanks for that and for God's hearing our prayer on his behalf. And um, he's, he's weak, but um, uh, the Lord is with him, and he's encouraged by that. So um, also be in prayer for uh, Marie's husband, Paul. He, he broke his hip, was it last week? And uh, he's in uh, a care facility here in, in Roseburg. Um, uh, Paul also suffers from Alzheimer's, so uh, we pray for him. And uh, that form of suffering that the, the Lord has laid upon his shoulder. And um, are there, I have some other things here for us to pray for, but um, can I lift anything else up in prayer, Charles? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I meant, I meant to mention that, so thank you. Oak Ridge, is, the fire is bearing down on that community. I think they've all been told to evacuate Oak Ridge. Um, Mark Summer was and I were talking about that last night. So um, there are other fires that are threatening too. Yes? you say Lynn? Okay, and that's your brother. Okay, so yeah, w please pray for Lynn. If you couldn't hear, he um, had an elevated PSA level, which is often an indication of prostate cancer. So I will pray for favorable outcome and also for the Lord to ignite in him a, um, a renewed faith in the Lord Jesus and, and do a good, a good work in him. Silas? Yep, yep, got a little list of things to pray for you guys. All right, let's pray. Our gracious God and our Heavenly Father, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we praise and thank you for the spirit of adoption by which you cry out in us to you, Abba, Father, you give us that assurance of faith that in the midst of our trials and sufferings uh, that it is no sign that you have abandoned us, but that you are calling us to, to put our faith in you and to trust your fatherly care of us 
and to know the promise that you have given to us that you will do us good in, in every circumstance of life. And uh, Father, we pray that you would remind us of that now as we, as we pray for our loved ones, we pray for ourselves and one another, that you would be a help to us in, in the midst of our uh, trials. And Lord, we lift up to you, Norm, and we, we ask, Father, for relief from the pain. We ask that you would take this um, from him, Lord, and help him to bear up through it. Lord, we ask that for Art as well, that you would uh, give him what he needs, that he might recover. We pray that the doctors will know how to treat him. And the balancing act that they are are struggling with now, Lord, we, we pray that they would find a way and um, that he would recover. Uh, Lord, we ask that for Danielle. We pray for relief for, for her. We pray for medical answers that she is seeking. And we, we pray, Lord, that you would bring healing to her. We ask that you would heal Paul and, and his fracture of his hip. We pray, Lord, that he would be encouraged, that you would remind him of who you are and of the Savior Jesus Christ as this disease uh, slowly takes his memory. Lord, we pray that uh, you would grant that he might remember the sweetness of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we pray um, for Marilyn. We pray, Father, that you would be with Orville and Marianne. Lord, we plead with you for Courtney and we pray for her uh, migraines and ask that you would give her relief, help them to discover the source and to find um, a way to address um, this great uh, pain and struggle in her life. And we ask, Lord, that you would uh, draw the Hallgrimsons close to yourself. And Father, we lift up to you, Lynn, and ask that you would uh, bring about a favorable outcome as the tests are, are run. We pray, Father, as he contemplates his, um, the brevity of life and how we all stand on the cusp of eternity, that he uh, would be reminded of his sin and the great need that he has for the Savior Jesus Christ and that you would draw him near. And we pray, Father, that he would be alive uh, to Jesus Christ. We ask, Father, that you would comfort the Bradford family. Thank you for Glenn's faith. Lord, thank you for the courage that he exhibited um, in um, Jesus Christ and, and is now remembered by his family. May that same faith be found in them. And we ask, Father, that you would be near to the uh, Silas and Noel as they prepare to move. We pray, Father, that you would, do, um, uh, you would pave the way for them in all the preparations and planning and their search for work. We pray that you would keep them safe physically, mature them spiritually, um, and show yourself to them as they uh, take this new journey. And Father, we lift up to you the people of Oak Ridge where the fire is bearing down. Father, we pray that you would protect people and property. Lord, that is, again, we see uh, what we is often called a natural disaster. Father, may the people who experience these things know that it is not nature or mother nature, but that you are there. That you are uh, showing people their great need uh, for um, not just having a good life now, but having eternal life. We pray that you would draw people to yourself and use even tragedies and, and trials like this to uh, wake people up and to drive them to the Savior, Jesus Christ. And we pray, Lord, that your church would be ready to speak the word of truth, that you would make us ready, you would embolden us in the, the relationships that you have put us in with unbelievers. Um, Lord, let us desire to be um, in, used to influence people and to uh, tell them about Jesus Christ. Uh, may we uh, learn how to and study how to not answer a fool according to his folly, lest we be like him, but then also how to answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. And we, you've given us your word, and you teach us how we can 
um, testify to you in all of life, and we pray, Lord, that we, it would be our desire to do it. And Father, we pray for the witness of your church, especially the upcoming presbytery meeting. May it be glorifying to you. May it be edifying to your people. May uh, you provide for the needs of your church through the deliberations that take place. And we pray that men would come uh, prayerfully uh, with hearts intent on uh, glorifying you and walking out humble service to Jesus Christ. We pray that you would bless uh, the decisions that are made, um, that they would be faithful to your word. And we pray for uh, the man who's to be examined for ordination, Yvonne, and we pray that Yvonne would would be well prepared, that he would um, be proved to be a workman who need not be ashamed, one who can rightly divide the word of truth. And and we pray for the Redeemer congregation in Airdrie, Canada, as they await um, their new pastor. We pray that you would strengthen them, bind them together in unity, the unity that comes only from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, Father, we lift up to you um, our missionaries in Ukraine, Hero and Anya Hakbor. We pray, Father, that you would give them strength and endurance in the midst of um, a season of ministry unlike any other they've ever seen. Thank you for the provisions that you have, um, the spiritual strength by the prayers lifted up in the name of Jesus on their behalf. And we pray that you would continue to draw people to Jesus Christ in that land, that you would humble uh, the proud, and that you would see that the greatest war that they should be concerned about is the war that that our sinful hearts make upon you and upon uh, your kingdom, that we might... Um, desire then to enter your kingdom while there is still time in this great day of salvation father may we be concerned above all else as we continue to worship you now that we are have been fitted by you to both enter your kingdom and to uh, walk as citizens of your kingdom and we pray you would do that through the preaching of your word and we ask it in jesus name amen amen we're going to stand together and sing um, I changed the song here um, just now so the the uh, PowerPoint slide will be useless. Uh, we're going to stand together and use the hymnal. Turn to number 67 B, Psalm 67. Um, we often sing this as a, uh, for what it is, it's a prayer to the Lord asking him to bless us and to shine his face upon us, uh, that his purposes for the nations, to bless the nations of the earth might be fulfilled uh, through us. God show mercy to us. Please be seated. Take a copy of God's Word, and let's uh, turn together to our New Testament reading. If you're using the Church Bible, it's on page 1790. It's Galatians chapter 3. 
Galatians chapter 3. I'll be reading the entire chapter, all 29 verses, our New Testament reading, page 1790 in the Church Bible. This is a very important chapter of Scripture um, for understanding the passages in Exodus that we're entering into uh, just now. So I want to, uh, there will be other passages um, that I'll be mentioning during the sermon this morning in the New Testament that uh, illumine um, the sections of Exodus that we're uh, entering into. And so I'd like to, to read to you now um, Galatians chapter 1 verses, or Galatians chapter 3 verses 1 through 29 as this is God's holy word. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Therefore he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. For as many as of, our, of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all the things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For the just shall live by faith, yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak in the manner of men, though it is only a man's covenant, yet if it is confirmed, no one annuls it or adds to it. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. And this I say that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ, that, I should make the promise, that it should make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator does not mediate for one only, but God is one. Is the law then the promises of God, against the promises of God? Certainly not, for if there had been a law which could, give, which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. But the scripture has confined all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Let's turn together to our Old Testament passage in Exodus, chapter 19. We're going to look together this morning at verses 1 through 8.
really wanted to preach the whole of chapter 19 as one, but there's so much in here to understand and to um, try and be real clear about. Um, because as Paul says here, you know, the Galatians were fooled. They misunderstood why the law was given to the children of Abraham. They misunderstood and they began, like, like the Roman, some in the Roman church did as well, they began to uh, uh, approach God through a righteousness which was by the law. But Paul says that's not why the law was given. And the Pharisees made the same mistake. And the, that the, the Galatians um, were making. And um, so it is, it's, it's quite common uh, throughout church history to see the church misunderstanding the role of the law given to the children of Abraham, whom God made a covenant to by promise. And um, we don't want to make the same mistake. So we have to be careful. And uh, we'll go slow here, as slow as we need to. Uh, let me read to you now um, Exodus chapter 19, verses 1 through 8. This is God's holy word. In the third month after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. For they had departed from Rephidim, had come to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. So Israel camped there before the mountain. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings. And brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before them all these words which which the Lord commanded him. Then all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. So Moses brought back the words of the people uh, to the Lord. Uh, This is God's word. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we uh, ask of you now that you would help us to avoid the the great error of the Galatians and the Pharisees and uh, many others um, who have, from inside of your church, uh, taken this portion of your word and misapplied it. Even as the people that we read of in this passage misapplied it to themselves. And we pray, Father, that as Paul said, that, or as the author to Hebrews said, that we would hear it and that our hearing of it would be mixed with faith. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith in his glory and his righteousness and her, his perfections. For us, And so, Lord, we pray that you would keep us in the truth and that you would magnify the work of your Son, Jesus Christ, um, the one who has been publicly portrayed before us as crucified, cursed on the tree for us. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Oh, we, we are now here, as we begin chapter 19, entering into the second stage, we could say, of the story of Exodus. And as I've already mentioned, it's, it is nearly impossible to overstate how important Exodus 19 through 24 are. Now, I heard one scholar who said that, that Exodus 19 through 24 are the spine upon which the, the, entire, the, the rest of the Old Testament is hung. It, 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 and if you wrongly interpret these chapters and their relationship to the gospel that was preached to Abraham, as many have over the centuries, you will get the rest of the story of redemption wrong. This is big. It's big. And so we should start by remembering 
uh, what the Lord promised when he first revealed himself to Moses on Mount Sinai in the burning bush. That was back in chapter 3, you might remember. And he promised Moses, right, that he was going to bring, the, that Moses was going to bring the children of Israel out of the bondage of Egypt, and he was going to bring them to this mountain where they would worship the Lord. And now they're finally here. We read in verse 1, In the third month after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai, for they had departed from Rephidim, had come to the wilderness of Sinai, and camped in the wilderness. So Israel camped there before the mountain. This is the mountain of God, Mount Sinai. So now it must be time to worship, because that's what the Lord said they were going to do when they got to the mountain. It is time to worship the Lord. If the children of Israel thought like many modern American Christians when they got to the mountain, they, perhaps they would have been looking around and they might have said to them to one another, hey bro, where's the band? Uh, how are we going to, it's going to be hard to worship without getting some good jams so that we can get in the mood. Or perhaps you would have preferred a pipe organ or or, or, or you know, as some people do, you, you, you worship, to worship God, you have to have the right collection of hymns or the right collection of contemporary songs. What you really are looking for are your songs, not the church's songs. That's what you need in order to worship. The use of images, perhaps, or uh, powerful, visible representations of some kind um, or another have been popular worship aids to the people of God throughout the centuries. You We'll see here shortly how Aaron and the children of Israel had to fashion for themselves a golden calf in order to worship the Lord in chapter 32. They just couldn't do it without that shiny image. Now, the Roman Catholics used statues and paintings and relics. The Eastern Orthodox, they use icons. Uh, some evangelicals use uh, skillfully produced videos, laser lights, and even fog machines to help create some sensory wonder in our worship. And we see all of these examples, in it, and it, we're right to ask the question uh, for ourselves. What is it that I think that I need in order to feel like I am worshiping God? Well, the second stage of Israel's journey to the promised land that begins right here in Exodus 19, it contains for us the Lord's revelation of what his people need in order to worship him. In fact, what we're reading about here in Exodus 19 is the very first worship service that the Lord gathered the children of Israel to engage in. And we see in verse 3 that preparation for the worship service begins with Moses going up to God on the mountain. And so we'll get a picture here shortly of the, this mountain with the glory cloud, the, the cloud of God hovering over the summit of the mountain as he is uh, exalted above his people. And so it is for Moses and for the children of Israel. They, if they want to see the presence of God, they must look up away from the earth because the Lord had made his presence hover above them, high in elevation. And the Lord did that on purpose, right? This kind of makes sense if you think about it. The fact that the Lord was lifted up and he was exalted above them, it, it illustrated an important uh, fact to the people. And that fact is that they must look away from the things of the earth. They must look up to heaven if they are to worship God rightly. And the reason for that is, is because true worship does not come from the minds of men. It, it's not earthly. True worship that is acceptable to God, as we see in Scripture, it must come down to us from Him. He, he must reveal it to us. And you might remember the words of the Lord through the prophet Isaiah speaking to a people who had perverted his worship with the, the doctrines and commandments of men. And, and at, at, by rebuking them, he told them in Isaiah 55, he, the Lord said, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and nor are your ways my ways. For as high as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So we see right away illustrated for us this this 
this truth that we must grab a hold of, that to worship the Lord rightly, we must first receive from him a revelation of his high and his heavenly thoughts and ways. We must humble ourselves before him, and we must think his thoughts after him. So Moses goes up to God, and the Lord calls to him from the mountain, we read. And young people how, how does the Lord start off the worship service that he's gathering his people for here? Well, we see there in verse 3, at the end of verse 3, that he, he's going to start it with a brief sermon. A brief sermon that he tells Moses to deliver to the people, and this is what we will consider this morning. We, uh, this sermon, this message, and, and let's keep in mind as we do this that uh, it is this message from the Lord here that is meant to prepare his people to worship him as he would have them to. And we'll see that the ba- basic message of this sermon is that in order to worship the Lord as we ought, uh, we must never forget who we are. And first of all, we see that God's people are the benefactors of his almighty power. The Lord tells the children of Israel through Moses, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians. You saw my power. Remember, you guys, that at this moment in history, Egypt, Pharaoh and the nation of Egypt were the most powerful nation on the planet. Pharaoh was believed to have been God on earth. And his people were quite proud to serve Pharaoh and his kingdom. But what did we just see in the, in the plagues of Egypt? The, but the Lord systematically demonstrating that his sovereign power and his mighty hand is over all of the land of Egypt. He is the king of Egypt. He's the king of the whole earth. He is mightier than all the nations. So the the omnipotence of the Lord that he used to destroy, so omnipotent is the Lord that he, you guys, he destroyed the mightiest nation on the face of the planet using an 80-year-old man with a walking stick. Think about that. That's how powerful he is. He, he's mightier than all of the nations. And, and the point here is, but by the Lord reminding of them, is that he is that for us. We are the people of God who are the sole benefactors of God's almighty power. And Paul puts it this way in, first, in Ephesians chapter 1, where you might remember he starts off Ephesians by calling the people of God to praise the Lord. And then he excites their faith to do that very thing by reminding them there in chapter 1 of the exceeding greatness of God's power toward us who believe. According to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things for the church. We are the sole benefactors of God's almighty power Jesus Christ has all power over all of the forces that oppose the salvation of his people. He rules over the nations of the earth for us. We, as the worshipers of God, the true and living God, we are the lone beneficiaries of the almighty power of God and of his son, Jesus Christ. And we have to know that if we're going to worship him rightly. Now, who else are God's worshiping people? Well, secondly, we see that we are those that he carries, he tenderly carries through every danger to himself. The Lord says there, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. He uses a metaphor here, and if you understand this metaphor, you'll see that this is a beautiful description of the tender heart that the Lord has for his people. Here he compares himself to a mother eagle. 
a mother eagle who uh, will uh, who broods over her baby eaglets as they are getting ready to fly for the first time. And so it is when an, a mother eagle it sees that her eaglets are ready to leave the nest for the first time. She will stir them up with her wings. And as they begin to, to fly for the first time, she doesn't abandon them. She flies underneath them. So if they begin to falter in flight, if they experience difficulties upon the way, she is there to swoop down underneath them and, and to lift her little eaglets up on her back and to carry them back to mother's nest where they can be safe. That's the imagery here that the Lord is using to describe what he does for his people. We are those that he protects from every danger to carry us to himself. The prophet Isaiah, in chapter 43, the Lord says it through the prophet Isaiah like this. He says there, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. And this is the promises that are being brought to the people of God when we hear Jesus tell his disciples before he leaves them that I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. As God's worshiping people, we have the promise that he will work everything out for our good so that nothing, Paul says, can separate us from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Because we are those that he tenderly carries through every danger to deliver us to himself. And now thirdly, to worship the Lord as we ought, we must know ourselves to be a people who are in covenant with him. The Lord says next in verse 5, Now therefore you will indeed, if, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be. Young people, do you know what a covenant is? Maybe you've been here when I've explained it in the past, but this is a a, a tremendously important concept. A covenant is, as the Lord speaks of it here, was a relationship that an ancient king would make with his subjects, with his people. And the king as the superior, the king as the sovereign, he would set the terms of the relationship. Uh, For example, a king might promise um, to protect his people, to feed his people, and they in turn would be obligated then to pay him taxes and to obey his laws. And the king and the people, they would swear an oath. They would, as they would, as it's literally in the Hebrew, they would cut a covenant. They would cut a covenant, and both of them in that covenant oath would be promising, swearing, to keep their end of the relationship on the pains of death. That's why some people have defined uh, a covenant as a bond in blood, a sacred bond in blood. And and to fully understand the covenant that the Lord is talking about here, though, we're going to have to uh, explore a little bit of biblical history for a moment, okay? Now, thinking of the first covenant that God made with man, we have to think of Adam in the garden. Hosea chapter 6, verse 7 uses the term covenant to describe the relationship that the Lord established with our first father, Adam, in the Garden of Eden. Adam's sovereign Lord laid on him the obligation to cultivate and to keep the garden. He also told him that he could eat of any fruit of the tree, of trees of the garden, but except for that one that the Lord excluded. Now, in return, Adam was promised from God life. And that was symbolized there in the garden by the presence of the tree of life. But if Adam disobeyed, he was promised death. It was a covenant relationship. It was uh, historically this covenant with Adam, um, the church has called, referred to as the covenant of works. And the reason it's called the covenant of works, is because the condition for Adam to continue to live with God were were his works of obedience to God's law. 
This is the nature of the covenant. Adam, do this and you shall live. And those are the terms of the covenant, which Adam broke, right? Adam broke that covenant. And, and the bond that mankind had in the garden with God was severed by Adam's disobedience. And Paul makes this a big point of this in Romans chapter 5, where consequently, uh, because of Adam's sin, death came to all of Adam's children, and that's us. Why? Because we all continue in the same sin of our first father, Adam. Paul points out there, we too are guilty of breaking the covenant of works that the Lord made with Adam. We are covenant breakers. But wonderfully, immediately after Adam sinned, the Lord promised to break the bond that Adam had made with Satan. That God was going to break that bond, the bond that we too, as, his, uh, as Adam's rebellious children, the bond that we too have with the evil one. The Lord promised to restore the broken relationship between himself and, uh, but between himself and us by, Genesis 3.15, by giving a seed, a son. The promise of a son who wouldn't come under Satan's control like Adam did, but would instead destroy Satan's work. And when the Lord called Abram in Genesis 12, our ears perk up because what do we hear but the Lord promising to give Abraham a seed, a son, and to give to that seed a a land of promise. And the Lord established this with Abraham and his children by cutting a covenant with him. The Lord would give Abraham seed and give Abraham's seed a land. And Abraham was called to walk before the Lord and be blameless. Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. But this time, unlike the covenant the Lord made with Adam, the Lord did not make the promises of the covenant with Abraham depend on Abraham's ability to, to uphold the obligations of the relationship. In other words, this wasn't a covenant of works. This is a, it was a covenant of grace. A covenant founded on grace in which the Lord told Abraham, it, 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 well, it wasn't a covenant of works, like we have to remember this principle of, with Adam, it was do these things and you shall live. That wasn't the, the terms of the covenant with Abraham And we see this clearly in Genesis 15 when the covenant was formally cut between Abraham and uh, the Lord. I've mentioned this to you before. A covenant-cutting ceremony in ancient times included uh, both parties in the covenant. So the Lord and Abraham uh, should have, uh, according to the ordinary pattern, uh, there would be a bloody pathway created by cutting in half to Uh, or more animals and spreading their body parts and creating a bloody pathway through which both parties of the covenant would walk through. Symbolizing, of course, that if I don't uphold my, my end of the relationship, then I forfeit my life. I will die. But we see wonderfully there in Genesis 15 that when the Lord made the covenant with Abraham, the Lord alone walked through the animal parts. And Abraham slept. You've heard me talk about this before, but it's, it's good to be reminded. What this meant to Abraham was the Lord was promising not only for the Lord to do his part in the relationship by giving Abraham a seed and giving them land, but he would also uphold Abraham's part by making him blameless. And, and he would also pay Abraham's penalty for failing, for Abraham and his children failing to be blameless as they ought to. It, this is a covenant of grace. But what do we see the Lord doing here in Exodus 19? As he calls Abraham's children to worship him. He, he reminds them that he has graciously saved them, right? He, the, the relationship clearly here is initiated by God's grace. He has rescued them by his almighty power under, you remember, the blood of the Passover lamb. He has helped them in times of danger by his gracious provisions, even when they're grumbling against him. 
it, it was only right that they, the people of Israel would respond to his grace with gratitude and love and faithful devotion. But listen again to the covenant arrangement as it's described here in verse 5. Now therefore, in light of the grace that I have shown to you, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all peoples. And you notice the word if. It's a condition. And, and, and remember the setting, where we're at in the story. The children of Israel are about to receive the moral law of the Ten Commandments and the civil and the ceremonial laws that will govern the nation of Israel and her worship. And the Lord says, if you will obey my voice, then you shall be my special treasure. Is the Lord going back on the gracious promises he made to Abraham? When he swore that he would uphold both Abraham's obligations and his own? Well, we know that that can't be true. Paul says it this way, certainly not. The Lord never lies. He never goes back on his word. The covenant he made with Abraham, Paul says, cannot be annulled. And what he is doing here, when he makes the covenant with Israel on Sinai, it must, it must only be God's way of fulfilling the gracious promises made to Abraham. This is still a covenant of grace, though we, f- we feel the legal aspect of it, don't we? But Paul explained it for us in Galatians chapter 3, how the Lord is, how he uses his law, he uses the threatenings of the law, the warnings of the law, in order to administer the covenant of grace with his people. And look there again at Galatians 3. I'd invite you to turn back there and look, uh, especially in verse 17. In verse 17... Paul says that the law, I'll give you a sec to get there. The law that the Lord, that God gave 430 years after the promise. So 430 years after he made his gracious promises to Abraham, he gave the law those that the giving of that law, he says, um, cannot annul the covenant God made to Abraham. For, he says, if the inheritance was from the law, it is no longer of God's gracious promises. So why then did the Lord make obedience to the law, the law given on Sinai, a condition of his people being blessed? Oh, Paul explains in Galatians 3.19. He says the law was added. The law was added to what? The law was added to the covenant of grace that he made with Abraham. Why? Paul says because of transgression. Because of our sins. Until the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Oh, brothers, it says if, if, we, if you don't understand what Paul is saying, here you won't be able to understand the role of the law of God in the Christian life or even the gospel of Jesus Christ. And consequently, you, you can't, we cannot worship God in spirit and in truth if we don't understand this. Paul said the law was added to the covenant of grace made with Abraham. Why? Because Abraham and his children are transgressors. We, we are all lawbreakers. Paul says in Romans chapter 7 that without God giving his law, we wouldn't know how bad our sin problem really is. He said, Paul says there in Romans 7, I was once alive without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was to bring life, I found to bring death. And he points out the problem isn't with God's law. God's law is holy, righteous, and good. No, Paul says in Romans chapter 7, verse 13, that through God giving his commandments, the sins of our hearts 
are finally seen to us for what they really are, and Paul describes them there as exceedingly sinful. You can't know the true nature of sin. You can't know the true nature of the covenant of grace until your sin and the demand are exposed by God's holy law and the demands of his law, which must be fulfilled and, and for you must be fully satisfied. By adding the law and the demands of the law to the covenant of grace, God reveals to the children of Abraham that the promises that were made to Abraham hinge on the Lord's promise to give Abraham a seed. A son. And Galatians 3.16 says it like this. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one. And to your seed, who is Christ. Paul says that the law was added because of the children of Abraham's sin, so that it might be exposed and the true nature of that sin might be exposed until the seed should come to whom the promises were made. In other words, the Lord added the law, and he laid it upon his people as a condition that they had to fulfill. But we, we need to be taught that each one of us, just as the children of Israel needed to be taught, that we do not have the power to fulfill that law or to qualify ourselves for eternal life. The Lord could make that promise to Abraham because he planned to send his only begotten son, the seed, the true son of Abraham, to send him into the world to actually merit salvation for us. As Abraham's son, Jesus, we are told there in Galatians 4, that he was born under the law. He was born under the law for those who are under the law. In order that he might perfectly obey the law and die as a lawbreaker for the law-breaking children of Abraham. And as the one that God sent to fulfill the law and to, to fulfill all righteousness, as Jesus said. Jesus is the rightful heir of the promises that God made to Abraham. So the Lord added to the, the law, to the gracious promises of the gospel, to teach us that we are disqualified to inherit eternal life. We don't deserve anything from God but judgment and eternal death. In fact, we are dead in our trespasses and sins until God pours out his grace upon us. In Genesis chapter 17... When the Lord told Abraham to walk before him and be blameless, do you know what Abraham did? He fell on his face as though he was dead. That's it. He knew that he couldn't do it. He, yet he believed that somehow God would do it for him because that is the promise that God had made to him. But kids, I want you to notice what Israel does here when they hear the Lord call them to walk before him and be blameless. Back in Exodus chapter 19, they don't fall on their faces, do they? They don't humble themselves before the Lord and say, like Isaiah, I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips among a people of unclean lips. No, they stand and they proudly proclaim all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. That didn't last very long. And it tells you everything you need to know about the condition of their hearts. That they're pretending that they have the power to measure up to the Lord's righteous requirements, that they can earn the right to be God's special people and to enter the land of promise by their own obedience. They don't yet see their need for the seed that was promised to Abraham. They haven't yet been humbled so that they live by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Now you can look at Hebrews chapter 4 
uh, verses 1 and 2. And it tells us about this generation of the children of Israel who stood before the Lord at Sinai. And we're told there that they did not enter the land of promise. God would not let them go in. Why? It wasn't because they didn't obey the law perfectly. No, we are told there that they could not enter in because of their unbelief. They, he, the author says, did not believe the gospel that was preached to us as well as to them. If you don't believe the gospel of Jesus Christ and put your hope and trust in him alone, there is only one other way that you can relate to God, and that is by the law. You're doing one or the other. You're either trying to approach God through the covenant of works that is broken in Adam, or you are approaching him through the covenant of grace that is sealed by the blood of his Son. Paul says that the law is a tutor that leads us to Jesus Christ, who is the only man who has ever lived that could say with a straight face, all that the Lord has spoken I will do. And he's done it. And when the Lord said in Exodus 19, verse 5, if you obey my voice and keep my commandments, then you shall be a special treasure to me. The children of Israel should have done what Abraham Ham did. They should have fallen on their faces as though they were dead because there is no way that they could do it. Like Abraham, they should have believed, believed that God would be gracious, that he must somehow make a way for them to fulfill the righteous requirements of the law for them. And, and we know how the Lord has done that. He's done it through the seed, his son, the one that he promised to Abraham. And so we see here that, that no one can worship the Lord rightly until they see that they are in a covenant relationship with him. If you, everybody is in a covenant relationship with him, not just in the church. Jesus Christ was born under the law for those who are under the law. That's all of humanity. That's all of the sons of Adam. They're all under the covenant of works. And so you will either, by birth as a child of Adam, be a death-deserving breaker of the covenant of works, or you will, by the new birth, through faith in Jesus Christ, be a child of Abraham through the covenant of grace. It's one or the other. And if you're not trusting in Jesus Christ as the one who kept the law and died under its curses for you, you cannot approach God or worship him. But if you trust in Jesus Christ as your righteousness before God, you are God's special treasured people above all others. You are a part of the, the kingdom of priests and his holy nation that God uses to bring people out of all of the nations to himself. Now, friends, Exodus 19, 1 through 8, are a call, uh, they call us to worship God first of all, by being humbled by the law of God. It shows us that we must trust, that we must be taught by God's law about the exceeding sinfulness of our sins so that we will do what Paul does. At the end of Romans 7, as I, I told you about it last week, when Paul sees the exceeding sinfulness of his sin through the ministry of the law, he cries out, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And then comes the answer. Thanks be to God. He does it through Jesus Christ our Lord. True spiritual worship begins with gratitude to God for what he has done for us through Jesus Christ. And that is one of the reasons why we read God's holy law in our worship each week and we confess our sin each week. We do it to renew the covenant with our Lord and Savior. We do it to be humbled so that we can be reminded that we stand on grace. And the law is our great tutor that leads us to Jesus Christ and tells us how we should follow him. 
And sadly, many churches uh, worship God without using the law to expose and lead people to the conviction of sin. I just urge you now, young people, that to, to see how precious, how needful it is in our worship that God would uh, speak to us his word of command and tell us what we ought to be and show us how we're falling short so that we might see that it is by the blood of Jesus Christ that we can come with the full assurance of faith that though we have disqualified ourselves, God has qualified us in his Son. So never stop seeking the Holy Spirit's work, that the, the Spirit working by the law to convict you of sin. Never stop seeing your need to be humble before God so that, that he will exalt you. All of us, we need God's holy law to kill us so that we will continue to live by faith in Jesus Christ. Only then will we wholeheartedly glorify him and praise God for the great things that he has done for us in his son, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we... We thank you for your holy word and for the wisdom that you have unfolded in the mysteries of salvation that is found only in your son, Jesus Christ. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to understand your holy law and its important role in our lives and to desire the, the convicting influence of the Holy Spirit upon us as he exposes uh, what we are through your holy law and your commands. And Father, may we cry out with David, Oh, how I love your law, O Lord. It is, is sweetness to my mouth. For it reveals to us the, the glorious nature of our Savior Jesus Christ and shows us his perfect work and, and shows us the very life that you uh, have created us for as we are called to follow him. And, and Lord, may we, by the power of the gospel, uh, be uh, committed as now uh, more than we ever have before to uh, walk worthy of the calling to which we have been called. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.